usually uh, you want to crush if you have big chunks of charcoal or, or if you were to buy lump charcoal to to test to, to try out in a small area of your garden you'd have to crush it you'd want to moisten it before you crush it because it makes it can get very dusty and we've had horror stories or horror pictures from some work that I've been was involved with in Canada after the fact I must say where they applied very fine biochar without moistening it and it was just a, cla a black cloud just flying away they don't even know how much they actually put on because they estimate that a third of it just blew away it does have uh, something on his yeah that's a respirator yeah. <laughs> Um, Just a dust mask works also, yeah. paper dust mask. Also, I should say that right after they spread it, pretty much um, later that evening, I think, or maybe the next morning, I incorporated it with a tractor tiller. So um, that kicks up some of it. You mm -hmm. know, that uh, there was a bit of a dust cloud, but not much. Pretty much running the tractor at a low speed, it seemed to get the vast majority of it in the ground rather than in the air. You can apply it very similarly to the way you would lime or manure or compost if you're using machinery you can just use the machinery also uh, it's a good idea to try to really incorporate it into the soil because that's where it's going to have its effect you know the roots have to be in contact with it so you don't want to just have a big thick layer on the surface and you know outside where the roots are that will also prevent losses uh, by wind or, or with water just running over the surface so you're going to keep your material more where you want it what kind of rates uh, on a per acre basis do you find necessary to get uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the, if you look at the research, you see that people have reported positive results with, I, I tend to say, between 5 and 50 tons per hectare. That's a huge range, you know, that is a huge range, but that's because people have been working with a whole bunch of different soils, a whole bunch of different crops, and pot studies in the field, so you can't really, you know, when you look at a graph, it kind of goes, it's all over the place. You can't draw a nice trend and say, whoop, the top is here, it starts going down, so this is the optimal rate. We really can't do that at this at this point in time. So we're gonna hear, I'm sure, from, from Rory and, and others, what which rates they've been trying out here, so I think that's probably a better, gonna be a better answer to your question. Biochar is not just one thing, depending on what you make it from, how you make it, it can be rather acidic, it can be very alkaline, it can have 3% ash, it can have 80% ash. Uh, you, re you really have to be careful. Uh, I think more and more people nowadays, and then we were just discussing that, are selling and using biochar, but it's not because it's black and it came from biomass that it's good. You kind of have to be, to be careful. And there are um, some of the materials that we have on our website at IBI, um, our first technical bulletin is simple tests that you could do at home to, to make sure that biochar is not um, not toxic basically very simple seed germination tests and worm avoidance tests you just do them with some uh, compost compost worms or red wriggler worms brought to you by the avian aquamizer our poop free chicken water visit us on the web at www.avianaquamizer.com